All right, I think it might be time to start. Welcome to the Liquid Star Q and A room. This is uh, this is where you get to ask questions of the founders. I hope you've enjoyed that presentation from from Liquid Star. What a demo day, hey? Nine presentations, pretty intense moment, and we're really pleased you've joined us in the in the Q and A room for Liquid Star. We've got the founders here, Connor and Scott. That's where you get to ask a question. Anything you've heard in the presentation, anything you've read about Liquid Star previously. If you've got a word of encouragement, you want to say hello, you've met Connor and Scott somewhere else, words of encouragement, ideas, please put them in the chat room. If you want to ask a question, please go to Q&A. All right, so chat room for comments and encouragement, Q&A. And I'm, I'm going to kick this off because I've got a question a lot of people ask Connor and Scott at the start. And that is, what exactly is Liquid Star? What, what's the product? Are you, is it hardware? Is it software? Is it both? Yeah, so, uh, hey everyone. Good to see you face-to-face -face virtually. Um, yeah, our, our uh, platform is, we make software that manages uh, the hardware of our partners. So that's the solar charging stations made by a, a local Australian company called Blackstump to about two kilowatt hour batteries made by a partner batteries that works with another Australian company called uh, Electrify to our own sort of chip and uh, tracking device that we put in the batteries to prevent theft. So when you think of our platform, think of it as kind of the thread that runs through various hardware layers and also operational layers. So our app is also used to help manage the rental and delivery process of the batteries. All right, so, so, so we're talking software. That was, you know, I've got a first question here, which is about secondary life batteries. Um, so is, you know, maybe you could expand more on Electrify and, and yeah, I'll add versus, some points new to versus that. old batteries. Um, yeah, so one of the, I guess, big uh, kind of beneficial side uh, perks <laughs> Uh, to what we're doing is that there, there will be is is the I guess the automotive industry and other industries like shift more uh, to using batteries. Um, there's going to be a, a, a huge amount of second life batteries coming onto the market, um, or a need to figure out something to do with them before the third stage, which is uh, just uh, full recycling. And so, yeah, we're working to include those. Um, I guess for these sort of semi like lower power applications that you don't need like vehicle performance level. Uh, and then we can deploy them in, in different battery packs. So yeah, we, we actually see that as like a huge potential um, benefit uh, to the model. So. Yeah, and then specifically we're working with, as I mentioned, a company called uh, Batteries and they make two kilowatt hour um, stackable batteries that are made from recycled lithium ion cells. So that's kind of how we're planning to work on that. Um, those batteries are already IoT connected. So we're gonna integrate that into our um, platform. And then specifically for the battery management system, that's the Australian company Electrify. So they're some of the global experts on making, um, yeah, making the BMSs for this particular application. All right, now look, we've got more and more people joining, which is great. Uh, and some of you are posting questions in the chat room. Could we ask you to put questions in Q&A? Uh, that's the chat room's for encouragement, ideas. You want to say hello, please? Could we, you know, let's see if we can put questions. And we're not going to open the audio today. We're just going to ask you to post questions. So I, I met these guys six months ago, and they uh, had all sorts of interesting stories. They've mentioned Nigeria today in the presentation. Connor Scott, you've also mentioned Nigeria, Benin, Puerto Rico, Japan, California. You want to talk about a few of the active pilots you've got going around the world? Yeah, so right now in terms of active pilots, uh, we've done two sort of, we call them nano pilots in Nigeria. And the reason for that is we really wanted to make sure that our solution from the beginning, we have the right stakeholders on the ground. So the people that are impacted by the, uh, the problem that they're actually taking part and 
you know, have an early voice in how the solution should be uh, delivered. And so fortunately for us, a lot of the assumptions that we had from those pilots were, were confirmed or, or validated. And so now we're in the stage of, of scaling them up. Um, I think for us, Nigeria is a, a, a very important case because given what's going on in the world right now with uh, coronavirus and everything, the situation there is, is pretty um, intense. Um, you know, one of our, I think in the presentation, um, one of our partners, Dami, was giving us a story about how uh, one of his friends there was robbed in his house just for food, not even money. And so I think one of the things that we're always conscious of is the fact that, you know, we have like Zoom meetings, these great demo days, all those things to kind of like pass our time. But there are a lot of people in one of the world's 10 largest cities that are trapped inside at the moment with no electricity, no lighting, no way to charge their cell phone to communicate um, with other people. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of reason and imperative actually now more than ever to, to, to do this. Um, then on the environmental side, I think a lot of other countries are uh, really gonna see an improvement in their air quality, et cetera, but Nigeria is not because they have as, a, as we mentioned in the video, 22 million small diesel generators, and those generators put out eight times as much electricity as the grid does. So those generators are working full time right now, just completely sort of polluting the air. So our Nigeria pilot has really moved to a focus, and we're trying to launch with a couple different partners, um, one of which is a, an NGO in Nigeria called Do Good Africa. We're trying to launch something quickly in the next 30 to 60 days to help with the impact. Um, and then really quickly, our other pilot in Benin, I think uh, Connor can talk a bit more about it, but we're really excited about that. It's a smart city pilot with the Benin uh, government. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that one's, um, uh, I guess, specifically exciting because uh, we're going to deploy a waypoint out there. Um, but that one's angled differently because there was a request to have uh, electric motorcycle taxi fleet. And so that, uh, the use of the batteries to power, I guess, mobility solutions in the future has always been on our, our sort of timeline, but this is like forced it into like reality much sooner. So uh, that's really exciting because um, we can start to more completely like uh, visualize like the waypoint is sort of like a electron based like economic hub. Uh, so if you can power uh, either like scooters or motorcycles or like tuk-tuks or other small light vehicles that can be used for delivery service or transportation, um, and then also have the batteries uh, to, to power, you know, households and stuff, you end up being able to deploy these things anywhere and then like kind of just pop up new clean, uh, tiny economies. So. Yeah. And just really quickly, um, just this week, actually, we had a meeting with the Minister of Small Villages in Indonesia. He was explaining to us how coronavirus, COVID-19, is actually already in some of these smaller areas, and they don't have hospitals or ways to like keep medicine cool and that type of thing. So unfortunately, right now, they're, they're pretty much their entire budget is going to like handle and work with this response. But he expects to do a Liquid Star pilot um, in Indonesia in the cities in the next uh, three to six months. So that's kind of some good news for us, at least, where we feel like we can actually help people deal with this um, new reality. Yeah, that's a, it's an exciting moment. Um, and I, I, I reckon there are lots of opportunities as well. We're getting a lot of questions, as we might have expected, about battery sizes and costs. Of, of power per kilowatt hour. So could you talk about the sort of, we, you know, we saw people in the video carrying, carrying batteries that, that the size of a 20 litre drum and others the size of a loaf of bread. And then in Australia, currently we're paying about 30 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. Do you have, could you talk about sizes of battery and the sort of price that users, for example, in Nigeria might pay for electricity? Yep, sure. So I think the first thing to talk about is the size of the battery. That's the question we get the most. So, and, and then, yeah, so the size of the battery is between 10,000 milliamp hours all the way up to the largest battery, which is 3.2 kilowatt hours. Um, and that larger battery, that's specifically for the Benin application for the electric motorcycle uh, taxi service that Connor referred to. 
Um, in between that, the battery sizes are 100 watt hours from our partner SunSync, 200 watt hours from our partner SunSync, and then uh, the two kilowatt hour battery that I mentioned from um, batteries. And so why we have those sizes is that there's just a variety of use cases that each of them can enable, but also we need a way to gradually build people up in the event that they're not able to um, afford the, the deposit for those batteries. Um, then uh, what was your second question again? Oh, the cost per kilowatt hour. So I think one thing that surprised us when we were looking at it is that people in the developing world pay about three to five times as much for their electricity um, as we do, especially if they're off grid. So an off grid person in Nigeria, if they had an iPhone, they would spend five, five US dollars plus per year to charge that iPhone. Whereas we would only spend maybe maximum a dollar uh, per year. So our goal is to really come in cheaper than that. And then at the same time, because people pay up to between 200 and 300 Naira just to charge their phone, uh, which is a little bit more than 50 cents, just to charge their phone on a car battery, our solutions price range, depending on the region, is between 150 to 250 Naira, depending on the battery size. So that's really that 200 watt hour battery comes in and that's what we've seen in our um, mini pilots in terms of cost. Yes, it's something I didn't understand initially when I first heard your pitch that, um, that people are prepared to pay, even poorer people are prepared to pay a lot of money for a small amount of energy, especially for things like mobile phones. Look, we've got the, the, uh, the other expected question is, what do you guys do about theft? You know, you've got a waste, a waste um, point out in a remote area at the edge of the grid, lots of batteries on board. How are you guys protecting against theft? Yeah, so I think theft is a great question. We, we get that a lot, but I think it's important to put the energy theft, uh, you know, situation in Nigeria in perspective. So right now, 40% of all electricity generated in Nigeria is stolen off, off the bat. And actually, a lot of times the distributors of that, the, the transmission companies and the distributors of that electricity, they don't even pay the generators for that um, ele electricity. So in essence, it comes to about 60% of all the electricity consumed isn't paid for, especially when you include people like wiring around meters and a very interesting problem there where the hardware, um, the wires themselves are actually stolen because a lot of the wires have to go through extremely remote areas with nobody else um, around. So that's just putting in context the theft uh, problem overall. Then specifically what we're doing is a, a couple of things. So first and most obvious is that each of the batteries are gonna have a IoT connected device in them um, and, and GPS tracker. So we'll know uh, where they are. They are, they are. Um, in future iterations, we'll be able to remotely shut off the, the battery um, if we feel like someone's stolen it or they're not um, using it correctly. Um, the second thing I think is more of like a design uh, factor. So we take deposits in three forms. So the first form is we do a graduated approach, which I mentioned previously. So if you wanna to get to the bigger battery size, you have to rent the smaller battery size for between 30 and uh, 40 days. Then the other deposit option is with um, a group sign up. So like it, it, we're planning to charge like 20% of the cost of the battery. So you can get a group of 10 people, all put that money in, and then you have, between the 10 people, you can rent the battery once. And then obviously over time, as you get more money, you can split that 10 to like 10, down to five, down to, to you know, a one-to-one -one, uh, battery relationship. And then the third option is like, uh, maybe someone is like a big baller and they actually have 20% to spend. And, and that option isn't that outrageous. And so, our competitors are people who are doing decentralized sol solar. And just to give you an idea, the deposit that people pay is between 20 and 50 US dollars. But because it's really a lease to own model, these people are paying like five to six times the value of the device that they're purchasing over a three year period. So they have to spend between 20 and 50 cents per day to access the device that they've, they've purchased. 
So really our solution is a bit cheaper and then it also is ensuring that they're gonna have access to the latest and greatest uh, battery, battery technology um, over time. Terrific. Okay, a reminder to everyone who's still is here, we've got a lot of people in the room. This is the Liquid Star Q&A session. If you wanna ask questions of the founders, here they are, Connor and Scott. Anything you've heard, anything you've read about, we're getting quite a few questions. We're not gonna answer the same question twice. If you wanna see the recording, you go back to the website and all these recordings will be available. Start to finish. If you wanna ask a question, please post it in the Q&A room. And also on screen is a QR code. If you'd like to express interest or invest, there's the QR code. It'll take you to the site and you can register your interest or invest today if you'd like to. All right, next, next question is, how's the transaction system work? If I'm a, uh, I've got a mobile phone and I, I come to the waypoint, how am I renting one of your batteries? Yeah, so that's a good question. I'll let Connor talk um, more about the blockchain component uh, of that. But right now uh, we've designed our system to be text message based using USSD. So the provider that we're using is a, in Nigeria is a company called Paystack, but that's an API that will change out depending on the, the country um, that, that we're in. So the person pays actually right now exactly how they pay for a lot of different products. Um, surprisingly, as, as many people know, or, or maybe they don't, uh, the mobile payment penetration in Africa is extremely high because a lot of people are already paying with um, text message based payment systems. But also a lot of people don't know is that electricity is, even if you have electricity, so a connection from the grid to your house or to your shop, you pay daily for your electricity because you may not have the cash flow to pay 30 days worth upfront because no one in Nigeria is going to take money after the fact. So they have already set up and through our partner Vista and Viathan, they actually have cash points set up to take in money. And then the question that we get a lot is like, oh yeah, there's a lot of theft in Nigeria. And I mean, to be frank, there's a lot of theft everywhere, but specifically we've designed the machine vision kind of like money counter to keep the tellers honest. So they take a picture of the cash, it counts how much cash is there, and then immediately updates the person's, the, the end user of the battery's account. Um, so I think Connor can talk a little bit yeah. more about the, the blockchain component of that uh, payment system. Yeah, so contextually, I uh, talked about it a little bit in the video um, presentation, but uh, we started like four, four or so years ago working on how uh, blockchain can support IoT for better security and interoperability, uh, but also for identity. Um, it kind of led to another project that's now been going for about uh, two and a half or three years uh, called BlockPass, which is focused on um, uh, self-sovereign identity, but like mainly I like secure identity for regulated industries, uh, for KYC, AML compliance, uh, things like that. So uh, that that is kind of, that's initially focused on human identity, but then it will also be working on company identity and then we'll link it up with uh, device identity. So with those three identity uh, hooks, um, that essentially creates like the, uh, the, the backbone that runs, runs our platform in a very secure uh, way. So, I mean, I could actually, I think we can bring Luke on and he can talk about uh, he, he's, he's answering the oh, questions he's answering directly. Yeah, he's, okay. answering, yeah, he's answering quite a lot of questions. Thanks, Luke, um, <laughs> wherever you are. Luke's another member of Liquid Start, and he's, uh, he's online somewhere in the world. Uh, Japan. Answer, Japan. Yeah, Luke's up questions. in uh, Hokkaido, yeah. Um, so uh, we, we don't, I mean, this, this basically can run the same way on the surface as many other like Uber-style apps run. Uh, the blockchain aspect of it, even though we don't talk about it uh, very much on the surface, because you don't really need to know that it exists, to be honest, um, that's definitely a very unique thing. I mean, we encounter this a lot, um, that, uh, that uh, different companies want to, or startups want to, like in, in these developing markets especially, they want to go to the next generation platform. They want to have like the Uber for this or that or like, you know, something similar, but they don't want it to be built on uh, the, the technology of like right now or like, you know, the past 10 years. And so that's sort of our, our, our secret element um, that is, is quite difficult to replicate, at least based on how we've been working on it for the last. Uh, and just to, just to fill in like a, a, another part of that, 
part of the reason why I think we're doing this and, and, and we're using the blockchain is that we are actually like researching and, and Connor and some of our other team members and advisors, they've seen how some of these lease to own decentralized solar companies operate. And they actually have like entire offices filled with people that are just doing reconciliation, right? And so that's adding, um, that's adding to their overhead tremendously. And then there's a lot of errors. So really our main focus is using the, the kind of like blockchain's ledger feature, which is really, really well defined and, and is being used by like large banks of a variety of different providers. So we're not necessarily doing any of the more, I would say, uh, you know, out there blockchain applications, but we're really focusing on how can it be used right now today? And that's how we're integrating it into our, our platform. And we have, you know, as Connor mentioned, four years of research specifically into that space. And so a lot of people ask us like, what's our competitive advan advantage? And it's that fact that we, that we know that we can do this for lower operating costs than most of the other people that are in this space, particularly on the decentralized solar lease to own um, business side. Yeah, and we can, if you get in touch directly, we can answer, we can get into a lot more detail on right. that side, so. I can vouch for that. These guys can talk a lot of detail. Uh, all right, the next question is, so we've talked about Nigeria and it's been a hectic summer. If everyone can remember, we had bushfires over summer. It's all been forgotten with coronavirus. Could we try to take the lessons you've learned in Nigeria and bring them to Australia? Let's imagine there's another bushfire. You okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll just jump into that real quick. Um, so the the two main goals of Liquid Star, like one, the you know 1.1 billion people, like the UN Sustainable Development Goal Seven, sort of like huge objective that we need to solve like collectively over the next ten years. Um, so that's one. But then the second use case uh, is is for natural disasters. So we, I think we started kind of looking at this initially with Puerto Rico because most of the deaths in Puerto Rico after that. Uh, recent hurricane came after the fact uh, because the grid was destroyed. Um, people didn't have the ability to communicate, charge their phones, and also uh, small like medical fridges and clinics uh, didn't work. So you couldn't keep antibiotics um, or insulin, things like that, refrigerated. And so Tesla did a great thing building that huge backup battery uh, in Puerto Rico. But the problem is the thing can't be used unless the grid is is built again, which could take a couple of years. So that's why we started thinking like, okay, well, if you, you know, exploded that centralized battery into a lot of smaller packs that could be carried around, just like how people carry around like fuel or water right now, um, that would, that would provide like a much more immediate response. So we actually been looking at this in, uh, for use in California for like planned outages. Uh, and then also recently there was a typhoon in Japan. Uh, so we were talking about that there. So, <clears throat> it's always been on our on our list of like important applications, um, but then Australia kind of came into the picture as well. So uh, it makes it makes sense. Yeah, just to jump in really quickly on that, um, you know, the interesting thing is the devices that people in the developed world want to power during an outage. It's the exact same as the developing world, right? So when your power goes out, you care about charging your phone, maybe turning on a fan maybe charging your laptop, maybe charging a TV. So you're actually not that far away from the experience that a lot of people in these developing countries are, are, are kind of going through. And so that's really our focus. Um, as a personal story, my mom used to work at the power company in DC. And during outages, our, our neighbor across the street would put up a sign that says Pepco sucks. That's where, where my mom, mom worked. And it was because like, you know, a lot of people had cordless phones and, and cell phones and then your phone is dead and if you have kids they're going crazy because their ipad or i guess at that point their laptop was dead so really we're focusing on these essential sort of devices but a, a, another part of it is that a lot of people have um, life support devices that require electricity so it may not be possible for them to to move to another area but having this like battery that they can go pick up or have uh, potentially delivered to them could actually be uh, life-saving. And then for the, the utilities, there's actually a requirement legally for them to make sure that they're taking care of these people. And so I think one of the other things about this question is like, what's our business model? Like, are we planning to, to charge people 
to rent, yeah, to rent the batteries. So we look at it as like the, the Liquid Star platform in the developed world is more like a fire extinguisher. So if you're a utility, retailer, et cetera, it's something that you have on hand that you can deploy rapidly to areas that are impacted by uh, natural disasters and have it as a, as a way to get people energy. Um, one of the things we learned from speaking to Osnet is that actually diesel generators are extremely difficult because you have to like maintain them if they break, um, getting fuel in after a disaster to them can be extremely uh, difficult. So that is one of the reasons and angles that we're trying to figure out uh, with them to approaching a, a pilot here. Fantastic. And have you spoken to anyone in Australia since the bushfires? Has that been a conversation you've had? Yes. So, so most of that conversation has, we've just been focused really on working with uh, Osnet um, because they're just a great partner. They're part of the program and they actually really understand this post uh, disaster energy situ situation. So we've just been focusing on uh, working with them to sort of figure out like, okay, how do we, what's the best way to deploy this solution in these in, in this particular scenario, right? So there were things that we didn't think about. So it's like uh, after a natural disaster, you know, a lot of roads have been deployed, but the, we're using a partner with a company called Black Stump. They've actually made the waypoints and charging stations for military and remote uh, mining operations. So they can actually be delivered by helicopter, plane, or even, even boat. Um, and the boat part of it to circle back was also really interesting for um, Indonesia, but staying focused on Australia, the idea is that this is something that's more environmentally friendly that, than deploying uh, generators, and it's a bit more resilient than using those same generators during and after these disasters. Fantastic. So what, you know, what I'm hearing here is that your time is, is right. You're, when I first heard your idea six months ago, I thought it was a great idea. Then crazily, we've had bushfires and coronavirus. And that's surely a sweet spot for you, you know. But, and if anyone wants to invest or register their interest to invest, this company's right. This startup idea is, is, has found an extraordinary moment in the present. You want to line up, there's the QR code or follow the link on the website. We've got about 15 minutes to go. Here are the founders, Connor and Scott of Liquid Star. If you've seen anything in the presentation today you'd like to ask about, they're asking questions, post them in the, the Q&A session. Uh, I, I, look, I've got one more question, which is uh, about long-term plans. What do you, what do you, what do you do with a waypoint when you've put it in for a year or two or three, and then it might not be needed anymore? Or the situation might have changed, or the grid's been built out. You got and that. People one. have other sources to clean energy. What, what can you do to waypoint after it's a few years old? Yeah, so the, I mean, the waypoints. I mean, they can they can be deployed. I guess. Um, for emergencies we see or disasters, it's like it could be used for the immediate uh, need, but the lifetime um, of the waypoints uh, ten or more years. So it can it can actually stick around. It can be moved. So um, I know we talked about how the batteries uh, are are tracked. Um, that helps us actually give insight into like usage and like where the energy is actually needed. So you can just drop one up almost as or drop one off as like almost like a like a a pilot or research and just like see see where the batteries are being used and that will help energy companies um, determine like where it might be better to drop microgrid or like where it might be better to like you know and then you can like move the the waypoints around from there so um, uh, yeah I think one of the other uh, things about that is that it allows uh, companies that are providing rural electricity service to be able to scale up um, because right now, the way the financing works is that if I am building a power plant in Lagos, uh, yeah, I have a fixed cost associated with the power plant, but I also have a fixed cost for building that distribution infrastructure and transmission infrastructure and metering infrastructure and payment infrastructure. So basically what we're doing for them is we're replacing that, that entire stack of transmission distribution and um, metering and payment with our with our solution then they can use the data from that to make more intelligent decisions so they can say like okay and this and this is what our partner Biston Viathan said to us is that 
they, they can say like, okay, we know that in this marketplace of 34,000 people, 10% of them are using the batteries and they're using the batteries at this level. So let's build the wires out to this point and then let's provide the connection to these like 10% of, of the houses. And then the great thing is like, okay, this is great. So let's take four out of the five of these charging stations that have been deployed around this marketplace and let's move it on to marketplace number two or number three or, or wherever. So that's really kind of, again, going back to this idea of resiliency, um, we're really focused on. And so we're actually talking to a lot of grants foundations now as a result of coronavirus, because th these are the type of solutions that people want to uh, invest in and, and give money to. Because right now, yes, there's a, a crisis going on, but after the crisis, what do you do with all of that hardware and things like that that have been given? And so why they're really interested in this is that um, and we're actually talking to a partner in Lagos now about this. It's like, we can have this right now in one of the most impacted areas of this. And then we can actually move this to uh, the Sura marketplace and put the, put the charging station there to help get businesses started back up, right? So these marketplaces and shop owners, they can come with the batteries, they pay for it. And then that's helping them sort of get back on the, that uh, on the financial on the financial side of things. So that's really how we're uh, kind of approaching it. Yeah, I mean, just to add, it's it's slightly separate thing, but um, just to make it sure it's clear, it's like the uh, the waypoints are are energy source agnostic. So we we're talking about like how we work with like energy generation companies, distribution companies, or governments. Um, they're not like they don't need to be solar. So if you have um, if you have like an energy station that is like only running at 60% capacity because they, they can't distribute um, more than that out through the physical grid, um, you can put a waypoint at the actual edge of the grid where it's no longer economic to deploy wires out even further. And then it can, it can charge itself off of like that excess like grid energy. Um, so that, I mean, that kind of goes towards the exploratory, like, you know, you can at the edge of a grid, you can put out waypoints all along the edge and then figure out where the energy is going and then like um, scale from there. Yeah, yeah, and we actually worked with uh, Andrew at the shift and did kind of like, I would say like a future world's uh, use case or talking about like what the future of electricity uh, looks like. And, and actually here in Australia, to go back to one of the previous questions, they're removing some households from the grid because the updates that they need to make to reduce the bushfire risk, it's way more expensive per customer than they'll ever make in the lifetime of, of, the, of the device. So they're looking for solutions to say like, we can't really afford to have this bushfire risk with some of these older solutions. So what is something else that we can use that's environmentally friendly, uh, modular and scalable to help to start to remove some of these people off the grid and act as that fire extinguisher if their generator breaks down or uh, whatever that um, solution ends up looking like. So it's definitely something that we, we've, we've thought of and are aware of. I think it's a really great point. I think uh, you've, you've, got a, you've got a product that can be used where there's no grid on the, on the edge of, as the grid advances and as the grid withdraws. I think it's a really it's a really good point, a product for all of us. Someone asked, uh, can you drop in a waypoint with a helicopter, which is great. And then they realized you'd answered it. <laughs> so that's good. So yes, we're confirming a waypoint can be delivered by helicopter and by boat. All right, uh, for those that missed the start, um, Liquid Star partners with companies to provide the hardware, specifically batteries. But we've been asked the question, how does a user how does the user know that the battery is coming to the end of it, either its life or it's, or it's exhausted? You know, how would how would someone away from the grid who's rented a battery, carried it 10 kilometres, they're charging their phone, how do they know when they need to take it back? Um, yeah, so that's, you know, as we mentioned, the, the batteries are actually IoT connected. Um, and at, right now we're doing what I think is the good startup thing and being very lean and we're combining off the shelf solutions. Uh, at a certain point, um, we will need to design our own kind of chip and we've already priced that out through one of our advisors who's gonna help us build that completely uh, at cost. And so, yeah, I think Connor can just talk a little bit more about that. But basically the idea is that 
the next iteration of our chip will also have that sort of battery health, battery diagnostic um, question that I think I think is is what we're really getting at. Yeah. So like a few a few points on that. Like one on the if somebody takes the battery home and it's like getting low, like the idea is that the when it gets to a certain point, um, that battery will like automatically notify through the, the Liquid Star platform that this battery is getting low and that will trigger, you know, just a simple like SMS, like you want a replacement battery. And then that's where the, um, the folks we call Power Rangers, uh, they're the ones that sign up users and like manage the station. They also will go out and like fetch batteries and like kind of do that process. That's where the whole like Uber and the delivery style thing comes in. So obviously you can pair other sorts of deliveries on top of that besides just batteries, but it's kind of like a water delivery service, um, if that makes sense. So uh, that's one aspect, but yeah, the, I, guess, I guess the good thing about the fact that people don't buy these batteries is that we can just keep, I suppose, updating the batteries, the, the chemistry of the batteries and the actual cells that we use, that can all change just as that technology advances. So it's not like we're, making a bet on any singular like battery technology. I mean, these things could be fuel cells in the future if that ends up like um, becoming like economic. So that will all just kind of hide behind the scenes and like the, the guts of the battery will change and evolve as it goes and it won't really impact the consumer other than the performance gets better over time, so. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to drive that point home, cause I'm not sure if we, we we really spoke about it, but I think really it's the, to think of us as the Uber for electricity or, or even more specifically Uber Eats, but instead of delivering food, we're delivering uh, batteries and electricity, but also giving you the option to go pick up those batteries for uh, electricity. And why to think about it like that is that Uber doesn't really care about what type of car you have on the, on the platform, right? Um, it, you can have a Ford Hyundai or whatever that was that car with the, anyway there's like an Australian car that is like a car with a pickup truck bed on the back and we, we've never seen that before the Holden, the Holden. Holden. yeah you, so you can you, use that to, <laughs> to, to deliver your your uh, your 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 uber food and and it doesn't really matter right so that's really our um, um, focus and then I think just to like really be specific one of the main things that we want to get clear is that our business model today where it's super capital intensive upfront, that's not going to be the business model in the future. Right? So it's like right now we are like Uber or Airbnb, whatever you want to call it back in 2008, where we're proving that a new marketplace kind of exists. So what we're doing is we're buying the car or buying the apartment to use the Airbnb analogy. And then we're buying the batteries included in that. And then we're allowing people to sort of use it to prove that it works. And then other stakeholders will come on and they'll purchase the, the entire system. And so we'll move from owning and having to front all of this cash to, to buy this infrastructure to having our partners who are going to be utilities, governments, and, and even just local communities that are used to making these investments that need to last, you know, between 10, 30, 10 to 30 years, they'll be the ones purchasing it. And we will move to a more, I think, software as a service model where we take a percentage of each uh, transaction that comes through to the platform plus charge like a monthly licensing and uh, maintenance fee. Yeah, and just to add a little bit to that, like the, at the end of the day, the, the whole Liquid Star platform, this concept of like human company device identity, it's really just uh, like a super solid, very simple and like efficient uh, asset management platform. In this situation, the assets we're managing are batteries and then also uh, the electricity and the charging stations and the individuals. So the design of the platform is meant to scale across like different applications um, and also be able to be used with, with I guess, different parties hardware. So. Um, we're already seeing people who have their own batteries but want to manage them on the Liquid Star platform just because it's like a better, safer way to do it. And so we're trying, we're, we're designing it to be flexible so that, you know, it's, it's not all going to be just the waypoints that you see in the video or in the decks. Um, that's just kind of like the best way to um, visualize, like it's kind of like the flagship sort of like representation of like the entire idea in one package. Yeah. 
Um, so those will be the nice ones, but they'll definitely be, you know, you could have a microgrid with like another sort of setup uh, that doesn't look like this at all, but it's still all powered by Liquid Star. So um, yeah, just to get that point. Out there. No, that's great. I think a, a very flexible option. And I think you'll find different countries and different people will use it in different ways. And I think the Uber is a great analogy. And, it, and I, I think it's a, a terrifically flexible um, configuration because it can be adapted to so many different purposes. So uh, we've only got a few minutes left. Now you guys, uh, have you guys talked about crowdfunding? If, if people, are you looking for an angel investor or if people want to give a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, are they also able to do that to get involved in Liquid Star? Yeah, so we are looking for angel uh, investors. Um, our target goal overall is to raise about 500,000 US dollars and that will get us between five to 10 uh, pilots in some of these regions and plus help make our platform more scalable. Um, specifically, we are actually doing a, a crowd equity raise as well to supplement that on um, virtual and it's been a pretty good experience so far actually. We, we've had a lot, a lot of signups um, considering that uh, you know outside of SBC, our network here in Australia isn't really that deep and it's also like a global problem. It's not necessarily 100% um, Australia focus. And so, yeah, you know, we are also looking for what we think about this is that this is a problem where, you know, a hundred dollars, $200, $500, a thousand, 10,000, it all helps get people who are really struggling with electricity and helps plug people into the modern, um, economy. So obviously we need those like larger checks from angel investors because at this early stage, this is unfortunately going to be a bit capital intensive, but any amount that people want to give, people want to contribute to help us get to that. Our goal of, um, we, we say that of the 1.1 billion people who don't have electricity in 10 years, we want 100 million of them on the Liquid Star platform. So that leaves a lot of room for all of you other people out there to kind of help and innovate to get to a billion, but we'll take about like 10% of that on our shoulders over the next uh, 10 years. And you, you can help us with that by, giving to our virtual campaign. Terrific, and there's the link. There's a QR code there on the screen. There'll also be a link in the website. Uh, we might put it in the chat room as well. Look, thanks very much. We're gonna finish up there. We've got one or two more questions. I think we've answered those during the presentation. That's been a terrific demo day. I hope you've enjoyed all nine pitches and particularly the Liquid Star Q&A room. Guys, thank you, Connor and Scott, for spending time with us. Um, You'll still be able to contact Connor and Scott afterwards by following the link in our website. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the Startup Bootcamp, Energy Australia 2020 Demo Day. Thanks very much for coming along. Thanks, Simon. Thank, Thank you, guys. You.